terrible job being the last speaker of the day because everyone's trying to go home. Uh, but the other thing is that everything that you have in your presentation has been said by somebody else during the day. So it really makes it difficult. But uh, as the day's been going on, I've been hanging all these different concepts, some different things together. So I think what you should do is kind of, kind of take this presentation as a bit of a sum up of the day. OK, because I'm going to hit all the points that were made in all the different talks. But what's really nice about it is that I want to really ground it. I want to bring the whole thing right back into the room, because we've talked about robots, and we've had Philips talking, and we've had all this big stuff going on. But I want to bring it right back into the room. And this project, or process, uh, was started by Jerry. And then he realized he was going to get very busy, so he kicked it to me. And uh, I inherited it. And the idea was that we'd just go out into the local community and we'd meet people who were living independently successfully. And rather than have a negative, okay, that we'd look at the positive and we'd say, what gadgets and things do you have that really help you? Okay, so turn it into the positive, bring it right back into our local community. So we as engineers and Jameses wouldn't have to do too much, we'd just go out the gate, down the road, meet the local people and talk about that. And the outcome wasn't necessarily to have a big PowerPoint or something with a p-value or standard deviation or tell you anything. It was just to tell the story and to create the connections because what we really wanted to do was to build the connections with the community. And I'm delighted to say that that's happened because there's so much happened over the last few days and around this uh, conference, it's been great. So we wanted to create connections. And then I guess as engineers in the hospital, we're an unusual breed of engineers because we meet the users a lot. So we're acutely aware that um, there is a design deficit with a lot, particularly of medical devices that are used in hospitals that are now going to move out into the community. Okay, it's very different from stuff that's consumer where there's a lot of universal design concepts there. These are medical devices. So we really wanted to give voice to the user somehow. So that was what we we're going to do. And I'm just going to tell you the story of what happened. So as I say, we constructed a conversation about the role devices play in supporting independent living from a positive perspective. And we kind of knew going into it that um, we were going to have some clashes and some interference. This is an interference pattern between two lights, okay? Oh, went on without me. Come back, come back, come back. I'll leave it. <laughs> Sometimes when you have two nice ordered systems and they come together, it all gets very fuzzy and confused, but that's where the beauty is. Okay, so it's really nice. So we partnered up with these people. It's the SICTA group. Okay, some of them are here. I think some of them may have gone home. But it's a group of ladies from the Liberties who, I think the polite thing to say is that they all have the free travel. Okay, I don't want to say their age. Okay, And they're all living independently. And they're all very vocal. And they're very passionate about it. And they're great to talk to. And I had a wonderful time. It was a lovely experience. Okay, so it was the SICTA group, who you've heard about today. Okay, St. Catherine's Ladies Group is what they call themselves. And I just want to thank Kay King, who's here as well, and that she really facilitated this and organized the access, so it was great. So thanks very much to everybody in SICTA for making it happen. So we had the conversation, and I opened the conversation with what I thought was something, a real open question. First of all, we explained what we were doing here today, that it was about devices or gadgets, became the word we used, and it was about independent living. And the simple question, I said, would you come someday and we'll meet Bring your favorite thing with you, and we'll have a chat about it. And it was no more complicated than that, a nice open process like that. And I want to show you what people brought. Okay. Most people brought a picture, a picture of a significant person in their lives, or a memory, or something like that. So nobody brought a device. One person brought a videotape, which is close to technology, but again, it's memories and it's pictures. And before I move on, I just want to highlight here, some people brought little artifacts, like little bits of jewelry or a bracelet, or something that, again, connected them to a person or a memory or a time. And when people did bring other little objects, there were things like lockets which had pictures. Okay, and this is a Christmas tree ornament, which again had a picture of somebody in it. And one lady actively brought nothing. It wasn't that she forgot or anything. She said, I thought about it, but I have no gadgets to bring. And I'll come back to that lady in a minute. Okay, so just keep her in your mind. And another lady who didn't really have 
gadgets. She actually thought about it hard and said, I want to bring a gadget, but didn't feel she was using any technology. But she, she was a collector of toys and dolls, so she brought this, piece, this little doll, which is a piece of animatronics. If you squeeze its hand, it moves and it makes a nice, happy sound. So this was really interesting to me as an engineer going out. I mean, we'd set up the question, I think, and this is what people brought. They brought photographs, videos, lockets, medals from people, badges, keys that people used to carry. It was all very interesting. So they were really connections with people or things that hold memories. And reading, listening back to all the interviews, we inter taped all these interviews, listening back to it, the discussion about that was, you know, over a third of the time we spent talking about that. And it was really nice, actually, it was really, really nice. But then I said I'd focus in with another question. So I sort of focused it in on technology. And I said, do you have any devices or gadgets which support you to live independently? And the sort of answers I got straight away were, oh, no, I have no gadgets. Or I'm not that technical. Okay? And in fact, they sort of brought the question back to me and said, you know, you're really kind of asking the wrong question. Because I said, to support and live independently, what you really need a family and people and community. And that's why we like the liberties and living here. In fact, at the end of it, I wanted to move into the liberties. It sounds like a fantastic place to live. Okay? Okay, and the sense of place and home. And all these things were important. Now, I've eventually gone on to talking about devices, but I want to really put that into the room, that that stuff is really important. So it's happening in a context. So then I got, I got blunter, as I tend to do, and I said, well, what gadgets or devices do you find useful or useless. And it's everything that you've heard today. The one that came up was the mobile phone. Everyone identified the mobile phone. And they all were here earlier and put their hands up. They all have them. Okay? But there was only one real enthusiastic user. There was one person who could give tutorials on how to use text messaging and all that. Most of the people wasn't just so keen. Some people said it's a necessary evil. Okay? They were very aware when they were using it, their credit was running down, it was costing money. So it wasn't great. A lot of people said, this isn't private. Why would I talk to anybody when I wasn't in my home? Why would I, why would I want to do that? So again, the social context within which the technologies are being used. Came in. And no one was using what I would call a smartphone, an iPhone, or a Blackberry, or something like that. They were all pretty much Ericsson-type generation phones, as I think of it. But remember, all these people said, no, I've no gadgets, I'm not technical. Okay, so we then got into this big rambling discussion about everything. Okay, I can see some of them down there smiling at me now. Okay, and all of these came up in the conversation. Skype, Facebook, computers, iPads. Okay, kettles that light up, which are really handy because you can see them when they boil because they turn off. People are using magnifying glass. Electric tin openers because it's hard to open the tins with the arthritis. Again, we've heard that in the other things. One of the things people really loved was their washing machines. Okay, one lady said, if somebody broke into the house, they could take anything, but don't take me washing machine. <laughs> Shopping trolleys. And then this is interesting, to connect with Jerry's talk. Potato peelers came up several times. That's really important if you want to make your dinner, you know, because it's hard to peel the potatoes with arthritis. And adapted knives. One lady had a knife which the handle had fallen off it many years ago, and somebody had put a new handle on it, and it had worn into her hand. So it worked for her. And she lost that knife, now she was in deep trouble. And I asked her, did you know anybody who could make one for you? And she said, no, no, if I lost that, I'd be lost. So my next project for Active Age 2, when it happens, if I can get some funding, um, I want to get the men's sheds together with the ladies from the Liberties and hack stuff <laughs> and solve their problems and connect them up. And I think, really, there's a lot of low-tech things that you can do that could actually add a lot of value. It doesn't have to be all about robots and stuff. Maybe it is just about adapting the handle on the knife and doing that sort of stuff. So there is some hackings of objects and environments about. Do you remember that lady who actively brought nothing? So when I got into her story, she lived on the sixth floor of a building, but she now had the start of an illness. She was concerned about it. So she moved down several flights, got the builders in, and redesigned her whole living space so that it would work with her, so she'd be able to continue to live independently. So I say, well, your technology is actually our whole apartment. And she says, yeah, but I couldn't bring that. 
So a really interesting thing started to happen. Nobody volunteered talking about TV, radio, landline phones, alarms, or panic buttons. Well, that's not true. Two people did bring panic buttons in, but very much at the end of the conversation. And there was, a, there was 14 people in this. Now, not all of them were from SICTA, because I picked up a few outliers myself. There was 14 people in it. But when I mentioned panic buttons, eight of those 14 said they had them. Okay? And they were really enthusiastic users. They had nothing but good to say about it. They found it very reassuring, an interface they could handle, a really good experience, because if you hit it, the person on the phone comes back and says, hi, Mary, are you okay? They come back with your name. It's personalized. Several of them had had medical emergencies where they'd used it and were now living again and were reassured by it. So this is a technology that's really working. But back to what you guys were saying about the young engineer. If I get a young engineer into the hospital and I say, we want to build a panic button, the first thing they say to me is, I can do that with an app on the iPhone. Okay, we do not need the app on the iPhone. We need this, which you can buy in Radionics for about a pound, one euro. Okay, so the interfaces and keeping it simple, that was all coming out. So it's echoing everything that happened today. So things that are simple, the interface is right, are an experience that relates, is personal, they're seen as contributing to independent living. And things that aren't like the mobile phone weren't appreciated, they went down. Okay, so we had all this stuff, okay, and we talked about it. And in fact, if you take any one person, they might like the TV and, or, the, you know, not like the computer. So there was no real mapping. It was very individual what people liked or didn't, okay. But out of the conversation, we came up with a rule which we're going to present today. And it's the, uh, the SICTA St. James's Law of Assisted Living Devices. And it's very simple. It's this. A gadget isn't a gadget if it works. Okay, so if it works for you, and this is what really happened, I think. If, the, if it worked for them, the panic button worked, then you don't perceive it as a gadget. So when Fran says, will you bring your favorite assisted living technology, it's not perceived, it's just the panic button in the house. Whereas the thing like the mobile phone, which mightn't work for you, they're not gonna bring it because it's not their favorite object. And we talked this out and this seemed to happen. Seems to be the logic behind it. And then I checked it out with the men's sheds because I met them well, as well. And I asked them, how many of you is your favorite object is your mobile phone? And no hands went up. In fact, in the room, how many people's favorite object is their mobile phone? A few, a few, a few. That's interesting. Anyway, so that all happened. Now, at this point, I'm going to take off my St. James's engineer hat. And uh, I wanted to really use the favorite things process to challenge and uh, to remind designers and engineers that they do need to go and talk to the users, which has been well acknowledged around the place. But I didn't want to do it by PowerPoint because actually I've kind of given a talk like this many times to engineers and they kind of take it and they nod, but it doesn't really go in. So I wanted to challenge it in some way. So I decided, um, there's my interference pattern, that I would take favorite things and think of it not as a process, but as a creative process. So I put on a different hat, and I try and take all that experience and bring it back a different way. And I like this lady, Bernice Abbott, okay? She's a photographer from the 40s and 50s, and she, she gave sort of interesting ways of looking at science problems. And sometimes if you look at things from a different angle, you can perceive them differently. So I thought, what would happen if we looked at this uh, project more from a sort of an art perspective? And that brought me to Ken Mayer, to Our, our Lady's Well in Ken Mayer. And I better explain this a bit now. Uh, on another project uh, around art and health, I had made some video about the holy wells in Ireland, because they're meant to be healing places, you know that concept? So you go to the wells and you take the waters and all that sort of stuff. Okay, and there's another concept in uh, Celtic spirituality that the wells are thin places, places where this world and the next meet and they're, they're thin. So I like that metaphor, and I thought maybe Active Age is a thin place where uh, the users and the industry might be meeting. So I was kind of drawn to the whole well thing. And then when I was listening back to the talks, in fact, two of the ladies who contributed to this mentioned going to the well in their interviews. So I said, I have to follow that. So I did, I loaded all the interviews up onto my iPod, and I went down to Kerry, and I decided I'd spend some time with the wells and see if they'd teach me anything. 
So this one isn't great, actually, because it's right in the center of town. And the more remote you go, the more interesting the wells get. So I visited one, I don't know the name of it, it took me a while to, it's about five miles outside Kenmare. And I visited another one, it's not a well, it's a stone, I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Um, it's called uh, the Calacbera, okay, and I'll just, it's meant to be the head of an old wise woman shouting out into the world, okay, so you'll see it in a minute. So let me just show you a video of um, the places I went to. The first thing I noticed, which was another resonance with this project, people bring little objects to these wells. So they bring the same sort of things, like pictures and bracelets and little keepsakes or reminders of other people, and they place them at the wells. I'm not really sure why. But they're nice places to be. And this is the Calloc. Can you see her head shouting out into the world? She's meant to be a feisty old woman who was wise, who'd give out to people. So I kind of liked her. I spent a good bit of time. And if you go to this, what you see, this is covered in all these little artifacts and objects, similar to the sort of stuff that the ladies from the Liberties brought when we talked about what's important to you. So I felt there was some resonance going on here, although I couldn't logically put it together, but I thought it was important. So I'll just let that run. I thought this next image was really poignant. It's a hair tie that somebody's put around a pebble so it wouldn't blow away and they left it on the stone. So it's kind of interesting what goes on in these places. So anyway, I did all that and I came back and while I was there I was listening to the interviews and I realized that the wisdom in the Liberties ladies wasn't what they said about Skype. It wasn't what they said about computers or anything. It was how they said it. It was the emotion. It was the language around the discussion. So when they said things like, oh, no, no, I don't like that, it was how that was said was important. So I decided that I would respond to all of that by making a, a well for active age. So the glass jar that's been lighting up in the corner with the strange sounds coming out of it is my active age well. And it's really... Uh, well, it can be for you if you want, but I really made it for engineers and designers. So I wanted to really challenge them. And I felt if I did a PowerPoint, they mightn't get it. So I just made them a device. Okay, so my well is a device. It's a piece of technology. Okay, and uh, you'll see it down the back now, but it's a, it looks like a glass jar. And as you go closer to it, you'll see it lights up. Okay, and you can see something's happening in it. But if you actually go over and peer in, you see images from the wells, and you hear the voices of the ladies from the Liberties. And my favorite thing is... All these gadgets, to me, are... No, I don't like this at all, no. I'm not really, I have to sit down with me. Because when you take that one down, it's so tough. I have a good jaw and a good laugh. I have a washing machine, it's very easy, very handy. You know, the usual implements, you know. All things like that makes you sad. I couldn't keep it up on a pension. So, the Active Age Well is a device. And... Uh, I've been watching people interact with it during the day, and it's interesting. Some of the engineers who've seen it keep going, how does that work? There's no plug in it. And I really like that, because sometimes when you give devices to people who aren't tech, they go, how does it work? In the middle of our, our conversation, one lady wanted to use text, but she found it hard to text. So I showed her Siri on the iPhone, you know, the voice recognition, so you just speak into it. She's going, how does that work? And I'm really delighted to see some of the engineers are down there going, how does that work? 
So go down and have a look at it. Um, it contains images from thin places, and it contains um, a lot of wisdom from the Sichter group. And I'm inviting engineers and designers to visit the well, spend some time there, and draw inspiration from it. And um, all that's left to do is to really thank the St. Catherine's Ladies Group for uh, participating with this and being so generous with their time. So go to the well. Thank you.